I declare there is joy in this house and let's get ready to lift our hands and praise. Welcome to 
We're just going to magnify your name this morning. You are holy, holy, holy.
us come here this morning and maybe we come here to, to bring our petitions to the Lord, our troubles, our concerns, and yeah, we come to church for that. But if we could just for a moment just put that aside and really think about and dwell on what it means to magnify the name of our Lord this morning, to really cry out holy, holy, like the angels are saying in the song. If we could just for a moment just put aside and just trust in God and just know that he is holy. Just put everything aside for a moment and lift his name with all our hearts. Yeah. Just gonna keep praising the name of our King this morning. 
as we enter Holy Week, we're just going to keep lifting his name. That's what our hearts need to be centered on Jesus this morning. We're just going to be centered on that, on his sacrifice, on everything that they have done for us. We praise you this morning.
our King Jesus went into Jerusalem in a donkey. They never expected for a king to go in right in that way, except, right? We think he's going to go in, in, you know, in a big horse or whatever it is. But he decided to choose a donkey. I want to tell you something, and I want to read you this word that is a prophetic word that was said about him and about what we're celebrating today. And it reminds us that no matter what situation you're facing, whether it's health, whether it's a loss, whether it's, I don't know, any, any situation that you're facing that you don't know where your help is going to come from. I want to tell you that Jesus today is entering your life. That today in ways that we, we, we might not imagine, in ways that we don't expect it, because how are we going to expect the king to go in, in in a donkey? You know what I mean? And it says here in Zechariah, if you read, rejoice greatly. I want to remind you that today is the day that you can rejoice. Because there's hope. There's life. There's salvation for you today. There's restoration for whatever circumstance you're facing. And it says rejoice. I lost the verse. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you. Righteous and victorious. I want to tell you today that in this day, our king is coming and he is coming. What? To save us, to restore us, to give us new life. So I don't know in what condition you came in today, but I want to tell you rejoice. Lift up your eyes to Jesus. And I believe today is a day of great things, of great breakthrough. Amen. Are you guys believing with me? I'm believing for great things that the Lord is going to do in my life, in my family, in my generations. So if you need hope today, I just want you to raise your hands. If you need anything that you felt you lost your joy, you lost your hope, you lost anything, I want to tell you that our King Jesus came into our lives to give us back everything that we've lost. Father, we thank you today and we adore you. We, we thank you, Father, and we rejoice for the hope that we find in Jesus. Thank you because, my God, you came to save us. And I pray for my brothers and sisters, and I declare that there's hope, there's peace that you give them, and whatever they're facing, my God, we're going to put our eyes on Jesus because our hope comes from him. Our salvation comes from him. And we honor you. We thank you. We give you the place that you deserve in our lives. And we worship you today, Father. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. And we all say amen and amen this morning. Give a shout to him, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. Say hello to the person that is next to you. Give a high five. If you didn't come with them, just say hello. We want to say hello to everyone that is connected online. We want to welcome you. Welcome to NUMA. We're excited to have you here today. Amen. How many of us received that word in Jesus' name? All of us need, and let me tell you, today is a good day to be at church. We're excited to have you here at NUMA. My name is Scabby. My husband and I pastor this beautiful church, and I'm excited to be here today, okay? I want to tell you that if you're here for the first time, we want to welcome you, okay? Welcome to our home. Welcome to our family. In your chair, if you're in the first row or if you are sitting, there's a 
green card. It's a connection card. We would love for you to fill it out. We want to pray for you. We want to ask the Lord to just do whatever he needs to do in our lives, but we want to welcome you to our family, okay? After this meeting, we will be, me and my husband will be in our welcome lounge, and we want to give you a gift. We want to pray for you, and we're excited to have visitors today. How many of us are excited to have, I see some new faces around, and I'm excited to see you here today. Um, and you can put back the card there in the chair, or you could give it to one of our ushers, the ones that have black shirts in the back there. They'll receive your card on your way out too, okay? How many ladies are here today? How many of the ladies are here today? Well, I'm excited to give you this. Well, you guys uh, know that our registration is open for Radiant. Radiant 2024, there it is. We're excited for what the Lord is going to do in our women's conference. The dates are May 17 to the 19th, okay? Because Sunday is the 19th. So we, we take it all the way to Sunday, but it's, fr it's Friday and Saturday. And we are going to have with us, I'm, 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 I'm so excited for the lineup that we have. We have uh, Mirka de Llanos, I don't know if you guys know her. She is very, very, very known. And we're excited to have her here with us this year. We're going to have Daniela Galeno. She is a, an influencer. She's a worshiper. She is known. And I've seen some of, the, some of the people, you know, posting about her. She will be here with us. She's a worshiper. But God is using her in a powerful way. She's, she'll be here with us in that weekend. And Mama Dorso, you know, you guys know her. Maria Dorso will be with us that weekend weekend and it's going to be powerful we're going to have so many beautiful things girls do not forget to register we have an open registration and just bring someone with you bring a woman that you know a friend a sister a mom and it's going to be amazing how many of, our, of us girls are going to be there in radiant i'm going to be there and it's going to be amazing okay so husbands boyfriends fathers Remember, that, that is going to be a good investment, okay? Good investment, man. And we're going to have some announcements that we have there. And screen, you guys could go up and, and put the videos. Dance the dancing shadows in the relentless duel against the light. Yet, in a place where no sound could reflect in the background, a humble and loving lamp lighter illuminated the lives of others with words that would glimmer for eternity. The beacon of hues continues to cast a living hope that vividly lasts, a light more vibrantly refined than the stars and sun combined. Yet, how could such a light live inside? Yet, how could such a light live inside me? Simple. Let it be a whimsical lamp that lasts with grace. Let it be a contemporary lamp that reflects eternal purity. Let it be a lantern that unwimberly guides. Let it be a fairy light that twinkles with joy. We, women, are meant to radiate together as a vibrant gradient. The electricity may sometimes wane. People may try to dim our flame. Batteries may flee in plight. Yet let us return to the lamp lighter's light. For his oil alone can ignite our eternal glow, radiating bright. All right. May 17th through the 19th. All right. How's everyone doing this morning? You guys are good? Um, so you guys heard it for the ladies. We have a... Uh, our ladies conference coming up um and we're entering like my wife said a very important week which is holy week all right today is palm sunday like you said and uh you know this week we celebrate the reason why we believe you know to be honest with you the reason why we have the faith that we have in christ is because we celebrate a resurrection. If there wasn't a resurrection, we could just close this place up and uh, let's go to the beach, let's have a barbecue, you know, let's go to the park. You guys could still do all that once the service is finished, but you could do that with the hope of Christ. You know, you could go with the hope of knowing that there's more than what we see right now with our eyes, you know, and uh, 
you know, this Friday coming up, we're going to have our bilingual Good Friday service. And I want to make sure that you guys are here, make sure that you get the word out and you invite people. And we have these little uh, flyers back there. Just take as many as you want. We made plenty of them. And this is for you to get the word out. You can pass it out to friends at work, you know, in your neighborhood. You know, you could go ahead and just, uh, you know, you want to go today to a restaurant and give it to your waitress, you know. And not only Friday night, but also Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. All right, we're going to have a beautiful, beautiful resurrection service in this place. And uh, man, I'm just excited. I'm just excited uh, that we even get to be part of of the things that that God is doing in in our midst. One of the things that we're going to do on Resurrection Sunday, there's two things that we're going to do. And there's some surprises and stuff like that. You guys are going to have an amazing time. But two things that we're going to do. One, every year we bring our resurrection offering. All right, it's a special offering that we collect just on Resurrection Sunday. It's not a regular tithes and offerings. It's a regular, I mean, it's a special offering that you want to bring to God. And uh, what we're praying uh, during that day is that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, man, that same power would manifest over your finances, over every area of your life that there might be death. And it's not that you're buying a miracle. I want to make sure that you are clear in this house. I'm not going to say, hey, if you give $10,000, man, God's going to heal this or going to do that. I don't believe in all that. You know what I'm saying? I believe that we are blessed and that the blessings of God follow us. But I believe that there's spiritual principles that we apply. And the Bible says that if you sow abundantly, you will also reap abundantly. You know what I'm saying? And that's the principle that we want to put in practice uh, on Resurrection Sunday. All right. And another thing that we're going to do on Resurrection Sunday is that we're going to give out a survey. I'm going to be giving you guys a survey next week because the preaching series that goes after Resurrection Sunday is going to be called You Asked For It. Okay, and that You Ask For It series is going to be five Sundays where we're going to be tackling questions that you might have about your faith, about Jesus, about God, about crisis, about, you know, stress, about the end time. So I'm going to give you guys out a survey and literally there's going to be like 40 topics in that survey and the top five are the ones that we're going to choose for the next series that we're going to be teaching. So literally we're going to go off whatever are some of the questions that you guys might be dealing with. So that's going to happen next week as well. And that is exciting. And last but not least, the Sunday after Resurrection Sunday, we're going to have baptisms. All right. Friday night for the youth and Sunday, all right, regular for All those that are not youth, that we're adults, right? That we're going to be here. And the reason that we're doing it the Sunday after Resurrection Sunday is that I'm believing that next week, man, there's going to be so many people that are going to be putting their faith in Jesus Christ. And then their next step is to what? It's to go get baptized. It's to go public with their faith in Christ. So if you're here and you're like, hey, man, I've never gotten baptized and I want to get baptized or I got baptized as a little kid and they poured water in my head and I cried, you know, my eyes out. All right, listen. And you need to get dunked. You know what I'm saying? That's biblical baptism is going under the water that it symbolizes you dying to your old self and coming out of the water to a newness of life. You know what I'm saying? So that Sunday, we're going to have baptism the week after Resurrection Sunday. So make sure you sign up if you are interested in being part of that. All right. I want to pray this morning. I don't know how many of you guys sense just this beautiful presence of the Lord in this place. And I was telling my daughter, I was sitting there and I was like, man, I don't even feel like preaching. And like, it's like, dad, you're the preacher. You got to go up. I'm like, no, no, I just, I would love to just stay worshiping the Lord today. You know, because I just sense the reality of his presence, the reality and the greatness of who he is in this room today. And I want to tell you something. You might be watching through that camera or you're here today. The Apostle Paul says, you know, that there's a veil that separates us from God. And that veil is this flesh that we have. It says that we know in part, all right, we know in part. There's parts of God that I know because of revelation. But one day I'm not going to have this flesh anymore to separate me from him. And then I'm going to be, I'm going to know him completely and I'm going to be fully known by him. So what I'm telling you is, is that there's more than what we've experienced even here this morning. There's a greater depth that you could go in Christ, in the Lord. And let me tell you something, you were created for that relationship with God. 
I want you to just close your eyes. I'm going to pray so we can start this message. And this is a beautiful message series because we're talking about Jesus. And as we raise up the name of Jesus in this place, the word of God says that he will draw all men unto himself. So Lord Jesus, we lift you up. We raise your name, Lord God, above every name. And Jesus, my prayer this morning is that you would become real in each of our hearts. That you would become real. And as you become real, you take that place of Lord and King and you start to reign in our lives. Father, that there would be this desire to surrender to you, Lord. It could be areas that we battled with for years. But as we hear your word and we know who you are, Lord, you're that humble king that came into Jerusalem many years ago on a day like today, riding on the back of a donkey, Lord, telling me that I could come, I could approach you just as I am. But Lord, I also know that you're Lord of Lord and King of Kings and that you're seated at the right hand of the Father. So today we surrender our lives to you, Lord. We surrender this gathering to you, Lord. If we're here, it's because of you and nothing else. So Holy Spirit, work in our lives. You can just put your hand over your heart and tell the Lord, Lord, work over my life today. Speak to me. Align my life to your purposes and to your plan and to your will. Lord, do your will in my life. Do your will in my life. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. And God's people say, amen and amen. Let's put our hands together for the Lord one more time. Thank you, Yadai. Powerful to see girls playing instruments up here, Yadai. I, you know, I thank God for your life, getting on that piano and blessing us with what God has given you. Sometimes we see Sylvia up here in a guitar. I'm like, man, I wish I would have learned an instrument, man. I spent too much time playing sports, you know, and I didn't learn anything. Now I want my kids to learn some of those instruments, all right? Um, today we are continually, continuing with the third teaching of a series called Image. Can you say that with me? Image, all right? And we're talking about the image of Christ, all right, that different people had throughout history. And as we you know, learn from what they share with us about that image of Christ. My prayer is that our lives would be transformed to be more and more like him. So we started this series talking about the prophet Isaiah. And the prophet Isaiah was looking through a prophetic lens. He was looking at Christ 700 years before he even stepped on earth, all right? And then last week I talked about the four gospel writers. You guys remember who those four gospel writers are? You guys remember without looking at your Bible? Okay, this is not an open book test, all right. Do you guys know who those four gospel writers are? Come on, let's go with me. The first one is Matthew. The second one, Mark. The third one, Luke. And the fourth one, all right, of those four guys, how many of them were direct uh, apostles of Jesus? How many of them? The two. Which one were they? Matthew and John. Hey, come on now, guys. All right. And how about Mark? Mark was writing, and who was dictating to him what was going on? Do you guys remember? Peter. Peter was uh, discipling Mark, all right? And who's the other guy? The other guy's name is Luke, all right? And Luke was what, guys? A doctor. Hey, man, I am impressed with you guys. I'm going to give you guys a round of applause this morning, man. All right, thank you for coming, guys. We could go home now. No. (laughs) I'm kidding. All right. And I said that today we were going to dive in and look a little bit more into what John had to say about Christ. Because John just had some crazy revelations of Jesus. John was that apostle, you know. I mean, not that God has favorites. I I want to make that clear. But I think that God uh, invites certain people to come closer. And if you take that invitation, man... You could, I mean, the door's wide open, you know what I'm saying? So Jesus had the 12 apostles, all right? Out of the 12 apostles, there were three that were always closer than the others. And those three were Peter, James, and John, all right? I don't know if they were more troublemakers, so they had to have them closer to him, 
You know what I'm saying? If you have a kid that's in trouble, you want to make sure that he's close. I don't know if that's what would happen with those guys or they wanted more of Jesus, you know. And out of those three, there was one, all right, that was even closer, you know. And that one is John. Actually, when you read the epistle of, I mean, the, 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 the gospel of John, he never mentions his name. You know what he says? This book is written by the, 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 the disciple that Jesus loved. You imagine that? It's like, who is writing this? The disciple that Jesus loved. It's like, boy, you, you have some way of thinking. I mean, you think about yourself a little higher than everybody else, you know? Didn't Jesus love everybody? You know, didn't Jesus love, you know, the rest of the guys? But he called himself the disciple that Jesus loved. And, and the Bible says that when they were there in that last supper, you know, which we're going to celebrate this Friday coming up, that John actually, he leaned his head on the chest of Jesus, you know, when Jesus was speaking about who was going to betray him and everything, and John leans his chest. Now, you know, you, you need to be sure of your identity, you know, to lean your head on the chest of another man. You know what I'm saying? I, I remember when I came to this church many, 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 many years ago, you know, I would see guys hug and, and for me, you know, as a guy coming from the streets, you know, a high five, you know, a little dab is enough. You know what I'm saying? But I would see guys like hugging. And then one time I saw the pastor just, you know, give like a wet one, a kiss on the cheek to another guy. I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. this is like getting kind of weird in this church. You know, guys kissing guys on the cheek. I'm like, hey, you know, and they tried to do that. I put my shoulder up. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, you know, I love you, bro, but not that close. You know what I'm saying? John is leaning his head on the chest of Jesus, which that tells me that this man had a different level of intimacy with Christ. You see, when you're close to someone, you don't need to scream. A whisper is enough. I've always said that. The closer you are to somebody, a whisper is enough. Now, that's unless you're Cuban. If you're Cuban, you're going to scream regardless. But that's another story, you know. I come from a Cuban background, and I know how that is, you know. Now, getting into John, there's a couple of things about him that I want to tell you. Next week, I will quiz you, all right. Next week, I'm announcing there will be another pop quiz, all right. John writes five, okay, of the books in the New Testament. Now, I'm going to throw one that you guys I have not given you the answer. Maybe you know this. How many books are in the New Testament? You guys know? 27. 27 books in the New Testament. Rene, we're talking about that on Monday nights, right? There you go. We've got a proud teacher right over here. Right? He's like, these guys are learning. 27 books in the New Testament. You know how many John wrote out of those 27? He wrote five. Okay. You guys know which ones they are? Okay. The Gospel of John. Then there's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. All right. And then there's the book of Revelation. And I want to say it. Okay, is revelation, not revelations. Even though there's many revelations in that book, he's talking about one revelation, and it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right? So it's important that you learn that. Babe, how that we're doing good there? Because my is in honors Bible class, and I know that she's like, what's daddy saying up there? So today's message, okay, I've titled it according to something that the Bible speaks about why John writes his gospel, all right? And I've titled this message, That You May Believe. Can you say that with me? That you may believe, all right? John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. I just gave you the introduction today, all right? Now, John 20, verse 30 to 31. Look what John writes. He goes, now Jesus did many other signs... When the Bible talks about signs and John is talking about signs, it's really miracles, all right? Jesus did many other miracles or signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, all right? So he wants to let you know, Jesus did a lot more things than the things that I wrote here, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So John is telling you the purpose of why he wrote that book. Why did he write that book? That you and I may do what? We may believe. Okay. What does he want us to do? He wants us to believe. So that's why he's telling us, amen, this Jesus, 
This is God in the flesh. And look at the things that he did. And that by believing, we would have what, guys? We would have? We would have life in his name. All right? So today, I want to tell you something about this amazing book. And, and, I, and I want to challenge you to read the book of John. It's a beautiful book. Actually, when somebody gives their life to Christ and we're there in the welcome lounge, I just tell them, start reading by the book of John. And from there, continue to the book of Acts and then just continue throughout the whole New Testament. Okay? Each chapter, okay, in the book of John, all right, he is giving a different image that he's seeing of Jesus, starting from chapter 1. So this teaching was kind of hard for me because in reality, I wrote them all out. And then I was like, okay, Lord, I want to pick four of them that I could share with the people. And then when I picked four of them, I'm like, but he, he wrote the book of Revelation. So how about if I pick three from the book of John, and then the last one, I pick it from the book of Revelation, and then we look at the image that John is portraying of Jesus, and we let that sink into our hearts, and that's what we're going to share today. We're going to look at three from the book of John, and then the last one, we're going to look from the book of Revelation, the image that John is trying to portray of Christ to us. The first one that I chose, all right, is divine teacher divine teacher. If you're taking notes, write that down. Divine teacher, all right? And that's found in John 3, verse 1 and 2. John 3, verse 1 and 2. I am really enjoying this teaching series, let me tell you guys. It says this, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler or he was a teacher of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night And said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one could do these signs that you do unless God is with him. All right? So Nicodemus is what? He's a Pharisee. What does a Pharisee mean? That he was a teacher of the people. And this teacher of the people recognizes That he's in the presence of a teacher that has come from God. And he goes, hey, hold on a second, bro. I I, I mean, we're all teachers. We're trying to teach the people, the law, the Torah. We're trying to teach them the ways of God. But there's something about you that none of us have. Now, he shows up at night because he doesn't want to be seen by his friends because he could get in trouble for what he's doing. You know, because at at that time, Jesus wasn't too liked by the Pharisees and the Sadducees because what was he doing? He was was going against the status quo. He was going against the leaders of the time. He was going uh, against the ways that things had been done at the time. So he comes in the night, and he has this image of Jesus as a teacher. So John says, I got to write this down. I, I got to write what's going on here. And the image of Jesus that John is portraying to us is that Jesus is a divine teacher. And you know why I picked this one? Because I was like, this one is important to pick because of a verse that is found in Hosea, okay, chapter 4, verse 6. And I'm just going to read the first part of that verse where it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. What destroys the people of God? Lack of knowledge. What did Jesus come to do? He came to teach us. He came to show us the way. He came to show us a better way. Look what the Bible says. Our, God's people are not destroyed by lack of prayer. They're not destroyed by lack of fasting. They're not destroyed by not coming to church. They're not destroyed by not giving their tithe. They're, they're not destroyed by not having fellowship one with the other. My people are destroyed for what? For lack of knowledge. So Jesus comes as that divine teacher to come and teach us and come and show us what had been written in the Bible, what the whole Bible was about and what God was trying to communicate to us, what he was trying to teach us. You know, as God's people, you know what the issue is? That a lot of times we don't know how to operate in this thing called the kingdom of God. And you know why we don't know how to operate in the kingdom of God? Because we are too closely linked to the world system that we live in. So we try to bring the things of the world into the kingdom of God. And I have news for you, my friend. It's not going to work. 
You cannot take, okay, what works in the world and bring it into the kingdom of God and say, okay, I'm going to try to make this happen. It's not going to happen. Because the kingdom of God is completely opposed to the way that things work in the world. For example, in the kingdom of God, up is not up, up is down. Whoever wants to be the greatest shall be the servant. Whoever wants to have should learn to do what? To give. And it's completely different. Jesus comes to teach us, if you're angry with somebody, that anger is going to kill you. It's better that you learn to do what? It's better that you learn to forgive and let that offense go. Because if you keep that offense too long in your heart, oh, man, that's like poison that you're drinking. It's completely opposed. What does the world say? Oh, they're going to have to pay for it. Oh, man, until they pay every dime, until they don't pay everything that they did to me, I'm not going to stop. And Jesus is like, you, you need to let that go. He comes to teach us the ways of the kingdom. And if you want to learn a little bit of how that kingdom operates, some homework for you guys. Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7, okay, is called the Sermon on the Mount. And it's just teachings that Jesus is giving of how the kingdom of God operates. He talks about prayer. He talks about fasting. He talks about forgiveness. He talks about divorce. He talks about all these different things that he's like, hey, guys, we, we need to get these things down. We, we, need, uh, we, need to, we need to learn this. So Jesus, the, the wise teacher, Jesus comes to teach us the ways of God. He comes to teach us to live like kingdom citizens. He comes to teach us to live as sons and daughters of God. So what's the homework? Matthew what? There you go, 5, 6, and 7. And I already had told you. And by the way, you want to read the book of John? Let, let, me just, just, let me just throw it out there. All right? How about you guys just read all four Gospels? How about that? All right? Like, oh, my pastor, you're throwing a lot my way. No, let me tell you, a lot of times we spend reading the epistles of Paul. Or, or we read what Peter had to say. You know, or, or, or we go into the book of Revelation because we want to know the end of the world and are we there yet and what's happening. I, I want to encourage you guys, read the gospel stories. Why do I encourage you to read the gospel story? Because you're going to hear the words directly from the mouth of Jesus, what he has to say. You know, some of our Bibles come, you know, I don't know if you might have one of those Bibles with the red highlight. Everything that Jesus said is written in red. Remember, there, there's a, even a song from back in the day. It was called Red Letters. You know, it's like Jesus' letters, they're in red. That's my study Bible at home. You know, it's like, let me see what Jesus said. Just look for the red letters. You know what I'm saying? Because he's what? He's the divine teacher. He's teaching us the ways of God. And John wants you and I to understand. Hey, whatever he teaches, oh, pay attention to it. Pay attention to it. You see, no one has gone into heaven and come back. He came from heaven. To teach us the ways of heaven so we put it to practice here on earth. Okay, the second image that I picked that John shares that that I, I really think it means something for us here today is the bread of life. The bread of life. That's a an image of Christ that John is sharing. And this one is found in John chapter 6, verse 48 through 41, uh 48 through 51. All right, and listen to the words of Jesus here. He says, I am. The bread of life. All right? I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world, okay? So I, I want you to understand Jesus is not talking about cannibalism here or anything like that. Because you might be reading it like, oh boy, that's like, that's some hard tea. And that's actually, you keep on reading, some of these guys are like, oh, that's a hard teaching, man. I'm not following that. And it says that that day many disciples left. I know that some of you guys might be thinking, but oh boy, this is kind of crazy, you know? But what he was saying, that bread is his flesh that was being broken on the cross, okay? 
that bread, and he does it on that Good Friday meal when he's with the disciple. He breaks the bread, and he goes, this is my flesh. This is my body that is being torn, is being broken for you, all right? So it's not that we're going to be eating anybody's flesh or anything like that. You know, be at peace, all right, with that. But Jesus is talking about he, okay, being that bread of life. And he makes reference to the people of Israel. What had happened with the people of Israel? You remember this? They're in the desert, all right, for how long? 40 years, all right? Some of you guys, I know that your life looks like you've been on a desert like 40 years, but this does not resemble what these guys are going through. You know, they are in a desert desert with heat, you know, lack of water, all these things. And God gave them manna, all right? Now, manna were like these little, I don't even know how to explain it, like these little kernels or, or you know, similar to like little pieces of bread. But it wasn't that it was like, you know, pan cubano coming down from heaven. No, it was not that. Because if you're, you're like, man, don't let that cafe con leche, you know, that would have been amazing. 40 years of eating the same thing, imagine. It was like these little kernels that they would pick up, and every day there would be fresh manna. All right? Now, on the Sabbath, the Lord would tell them the day before, pick up twice, because the following day you're not to work, so you're going to have enough. And if you pick, okay, uh, then it's going to get bad, so don't do it. So God provided, listen to what I'm going to say, God provided, okay, for their sustainment on a daily basis. And Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. In other words, I am the one that sustains you. I am the one that upholds you. I am the one that provides for your needs. I am the one, okay, that is broken so that you don't have to go through some of the things that I went through. I am the one that sustains you. I love that. And Jesus is not speaking, okay, about a physical hunger here. Because you might be listening, man, bread of life. And you might be there, man, I haven't even had breakfast, bro. I'm like starving right now. No, no, no. Listen, he's speaking about the condition of your soul. He's speaking about how, how, how you might find yourself spiritually today. All right, and let me tell you something. The only one that can satisfy the souls of men is Christ. The only one that can satisfy the souls of men, okay, is Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can meet you right there where you're at, okay, and give you everything that you need. A lot of us are living empty lives, guys, futile. A lot of us, you know, we're aiming here, we're aiming here, we're trying to do all these different things, trying to bring satisfaction into our lives. But let me tell you something, Jesus promises something different. These are not just empty words. Jesus is not offering us, okay, pay attention, a religion. Jesus is not offering us a temporary fix. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. This is not just for a moment. This is for life. This is forever, guys. You don't need to have Jesus and say, well, I need to find something else because this is not enough. I'm still hungry. Now, let me tell you something. If you get your fill of Jesus, you're not going to look for anything else. Oh, he's going to satisfy everything that you're looking for. He's going to fill every need that you have in your soul, in your heart. And maybe you're here this morning and you feel empty. Maybe you're watching through that camera today and there's pain and there's hurt and and you've been searching, you've been searching, you've been searching. Let me tell you, after today, I pray that you don't have to search anymore. I pray that after today, you could eat of that bread of life. What do I mean by that? You could have that relationship with Christ. You could invite Christ into your heart, into your life, and that your life will be changed forever. Forever. You see, this Friday coming up is going to be my birthday, not my physical birthday, my spiritual birthday. I gave my life to the Lord on a good Friday, 1995. And let me tell you something. Something happened in my heart at 18 years old that I never had to go back. I remember before I knew the Lord, I had to keep going back to different things to try to 
find that little joy, find that little fulfillment, find that, you know, uh, I don't know, you, you know people like this, they, they live for Friday, they live for the weekend, oh, I can't wait for Friday, Monday, oh, Friday's coming. Friday's coming because, man, I'm going to party Friday, I'm going to party Saturday, I'm going to party Sunday. Then Monday, oh, Friday's coming. I don't have to wait for Friday. I can't wait for Monday to come. I can't wait for Tuesday to come. I can't wait for Wednesday to come because I am satisfied. I am filled. He met all my needs. He wants to meet all your needs the same way. He wants you to go home today, man, and you're just satisfied. Have you ever ate a good meal? And they come and they offer you something else that you like. But all of a sudden, you're like, I'm good, man. Because you just feel satisfied. Has that happened to you? You know what? That's what the Lord wants to do in your life. That you take of him and whatever the world comes to offer you, you're like, I'm good. I don't need that. I'm fine. I have so many things that I want to share. And I'm like picking and choosing here. I want to jump into the third one because I think that this one's amazing. The third image of Christ here from the, from the book of John that I want to share with you guys today is the light of the world. The light of the world. The light of the world. This image that John has of Jesus as the light of the world. Now, Jesus is walking around with his disciples and, and they pull up to some guy that is on the side of the road and he's blind. And, and, and I love this story because actually we're, we're going to read that, that first part right now. It's found in John 9, uh, verse 1 through 5, because Jesus actually chooses this man to do something amazing. John 9, okay, verse 1 through 5, it says this. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, by the way, the word rabbi means teacher, okay, so teacher, okay, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Because night is coming where no one could work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. What did Jesus say? I am what? The light of what? All right, let me tell you. That is a very audacious claim that Jesus made right there. That's very bold. <laughs> that's, that's very bold for Jesus to say, I am the light of the world. And, and when I hear that, I'm like, okay, Jesus, you better prove it. So I thought that there's some students here today, you know, and I know that some of you guys get all these projects that you guys have to do for school, and some of you guys are in college and all that. I remember when I was in school, you know, when, when we needed to prove something, we needed to use something called the scientific method. Remember the scientific method? Any of you guys know the scientific method? So we're like, Pastor, I came to church to run away from school, and now you're bringing this here. You know, the scientific method way of proving, okay, things. And how does the scientific method work? Because I see this perfectly here in this that we're living. The scientific method, first you ask a question. Okay, you ask a question. And there's a question that the disciples ask. The question that they have is, who sinned? That's a question that is being posed, all right? So then you do a background search. That's the second step of the scientific. So the background search is, is it this man? Where does his parents? Let's dig into his past and, and, and let's see what we find. And, and, and they're searching. What, what did they do? What did, what did he do to be in this? No, no, no. He didn't do anything. Okay. It has to be his parents. No. Uh, his parents. Uh, so then you construct a what? Remember the word hypothesis? Any of you guys remember that word? And you're like, oh, man, that's too much for me on a Sunday morning. Come on. Let's push through, guys. Come on. Okay, you construct what? A hypothesis. And Jesus brings his hypothesis. And what's Jesus' hypothesis? He goes, neither did he sin nor his parents, but he is blind that the works of God may be manifested in him. That's a hypothesis. Like, hmm, all right. So, so then the next step is like, okay, we got to test this with an experiment. 
We're just going to have to do an experiment to see if this hypothesis that Jesus is bringing, if this is going to work. You know, and, and, and you know where the experiment is? Well, it's right there in John 9, verse 6, and the first part of verse 7. Do you see it right here? All right. Then Jesus spits on the ground. Oh, my God. This is a, well, you better put the goggles on for this one, you know. You better put your white, you know, scientist look. And Jesus spits on the ground, okay, and he makes mud with the saliva, and he spreads the mud over the blind man's eyes. He's doing an experiment. In a couple of weeks here at Numa Christian Academy, we're going to be having uh, our science fair. And every year we come to the science fair and the kids are dressed up and they're ready to go and they have all these experiences. Well, Jesus is doing an amazing experiment. He, he just says, okay, we're going to take care of this issue. We're going to spit on the floor, and we're going to make some mud, and we're going to take this mud and put it on the blind man's eyes. And, and you know what I think about this? I'm like, oh, thank God that this guy was blind because he was not seeing what was really happening. Because if he was seeing what was happening, he's like, hey, Jesus, you know, just send the word and I will be healed. <laughs> <You know? laughs> just say it. You don't need to really do anything there. <laughs> So Jesus takes the mud, all right, he puts it on the man's eyes, the guy doesn't know what Jesus did, and he tells him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam, all right, so there is the experiment. We're following the scientific method to this miracle that Jesus did. So he goes to the pool of Siloam. All right, and then the next step in the scientific method is which one is the procedure, all right, if it's working or not. Did this work? So we go to the second part of verse 7, and what happens? So the man went and washed and came back seeing. <laughs> okay, so so far the hypothesis Okay, this guy didn't sin. His parents, this is happening so that the glory of God be manifested in him. And so he does the experiment. Let's go ahead and do this. Is it working? Oh, yeah, you better believe it's working. What's happening with the guy? He's coming back and he's seeing. A guy born blind can now see. What was the claim that Jesus had made? Jesus had made the claim, I am the light of the world. That's very bold. So let's try it with a guy that has never seen light before. Let's try it with a guy that doesn't have an idea what light looks like. <laughs> and then we need to analyze the data. Oh, PC, I got it down today, guys. You got to analyze the data and you got to draw conclusions. Where's the data? Where's the conclusions? Verse 8 through 10 is there in the Bible. It says this, his neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? They're analyzing the data. I'm like, this is amazing. This can't be happening. Why is this guy seeing? And some said that he was and others said, no, he just looks like him. You see, it, it, it I baffled their minds what was happening here. But the beggar kept saying, okay, yes, I am the same one. And they asked, who healed you? What happened? All right. So they're trying to get their conclusion here of, of, of what's going on. And the last step of the scientific method is which one? You communicate the results. And what was the result? Verse 11, and he told them, the man they call Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. He shared the results. Here I am. I was blind. I could see. Why? Because I had an encounter with the light of God. I had an encounter with the light of the world. So what is the conclusion? Jesus is the light of the world because only he can make the blind see. And if you're in this room today, or you're watching through that camera today, and there's blindness inside of you, let me tell you something. 
the healer is in this room. Oh, the light of the world is in this room right now. And he can make you see. You're like, Pastor, I can't see. I can see not even one foot away from my face. I can't see. I can't see what I'm going to do today. I can't see what I'm going to do tomorrow. I can't see what's happening with my life. I can't see where I'm going. I can't see what's going to happen in the next month. I can't see what's going to happen in the next six months. If you are blind... Let me tell you, the light of the world is here. And he's ready to shine some light in those areas of darkness in your life. And I want to tell you something. Don't be afraid of running to the light. Don't be afraid of running to the light. Because only if you run to the light will those areas of darkness, of pain, of hurt, that's the only way they're going to be healed. Usually when I eat, I'm like a messy eater, you know. And when we go eat, I have a target. And you know what's my target? I want to make sure I get out of there, bro, and I'm, I'm still clean. Does that happen to you sometimes? And then last week was a mess. And I don't know if you remember last week. I put on a white shirt, and I had like a beige jacket. And we went to eat after the service. And, and, and the food that I ordered is the type that could like sprinkle back on you. So when I ordered the food, I'm like, oh, why did I order this? I'm like, and why am I wearing this? I'm like, I'm going to have to make it through this lunch. And the whole time I was eating, like, far away from the table. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm going to bring this to my, because I want to stay clean. Does this happen to you? You know, or is it just me? You know, that, you know usually, and if you eat spaghetti, it's like, bah, you know, like, red right there. And then you have an important meeting after that, you know, you're like trying to walk. And then you have like the wet spot here and everything just smeared. Has that happened to you? It happens to me a lot. Uh, you know what the good thing is that if the meeting is in the dark, I have no problem. Because if we shut down all the lights, you know what's going to happen? No one is going to see anything. They're not going to see if I'm dirty or not. But you know what? If the meeting is in a room like this, like all you guys are looking at me right now. All these lights are shining here. All right? Do I say it, baby? Do I say it? So this morning I'm getting dressed and my wife is like, don't put that on. I'm like, why shouldn't I put this on? And she goes, because you wore those same jeans last week. Don't put those jeans on. And I was already almost ready to go. I'm like, you're kidding me. I, wrote, I don't even remember what I, wrote, what I wore yesterday, you know. These guys are not going to remember that I wore these jeans last week. And she goes, you came on on camera. They, they could just go back. They could, I'm like, all right, let me go change my jeans and put some other jeans and stuff like that. Uh, by the way, some time ago I couldn't fit into these jeans. Now I can fit into these jeans. So I'm excited about that. Can I, can I share some good news with you guys this morning? Since January 5th. Eighth, that we started our fast and we did our fast and I stayed working out. I have lost 17 pounds this year. All right. And we're working hard to keep them off. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm at that point in my life that I drink water and it's like three pounds. Like, what the heck is happening here, bro? You know, so if this meeting was in the dark, nobody could really see if there's anything going on with me or not because I'm in the shadows. But when the light turns on, you get, oh, PC, you dirty your shirt, bro. Hey, you went eating the other day and you're smeared. Now, the light is good. Why? Because unless you see that you're dirty, okay, you just go around making a fool of yourself. Because usually, you know what happens? There's blind spots that you and I have that others see, but you don't see. Has that ever happened to you before? Other people see things about your life that you don't see. So when I get closer to the light, I get closer to the light of the world, which is Jesus. You know what he starts to do? He starts to cleanse me. He starts to clean me. And all these smeared areas, all these dirty areas, he starts to clean them. Not that I'm perfect. Anybody perfect in this room today? You'll be preaching next Sunday on Resurrection Sunday. All right. <laughs> all right. Nobody perfect in this room. Nobody perfect looking through that camera. But you know what? Jesus is working in us. The light of the world is shining his light on our darkness. And little by little, we can say, hey, yesterday was a little darker. Today is a little bit more light. Yesterday was raining bad. Friday was raining bad. 
Today I went out and all the colors came out. You know, it's like beautiful this morning. And the last one that I want to go in today, so we close. All right. Oh, and by the way, I know that some of you guys were like, Pastor, there's some other good ones there in John. I know, I know. I was, I was debating, you know. You f- see Jesus as the great physician. In John 5, you see Jesus as the water of life. You see Jesus as the good shepherd. In John 10, you look at Jesus as the true vine. In chapter 14, you see all these images of Jesus. Chapter 15, I'm sorry. You see all these images of Jesus, but I had to pick. And it got hard because I wanted to go into the book of Revelation to close my message. Because there's no better way to close this message on Palm Sunday than looking at the image of Jesus that John had. When he was a prisoner in the Isle of Patmos. And I want to take a moment to speak about that. Worship team, you guys could join. Because John was, listen to this. The only one of the apostles that was not martyred was John. He was the only one. So maybe there was a little bit of favoritism in there after all, right? Everybody else was sawed in half. You know, they were crucified upside down, set on fire alive. John was not. John died as an old man. Some of the people, you know, historians think that John was anywhere between 90 and 95 when he died. But he was a prisoner in the Isle of Patmos. They, they said, this guy is too dangerous to have him around. We're going to send him to an isolated, you know, to a desert island all by himself. And they had him there in the Isle of Patmos. And while he's there in that island all by himself, he has this revelation of Jesus, which is the book of Revelation. And he sees the Lord showing up. You see, I want to tell you something. When you think you're alone, you're really never alone. When you think that you're by yourself, you're really not by yourself. The Lord is always there with you. No matter what you're going through, no matter the pain, no matter the circumstance, the Lord is there with you. And, and, and the book of Revelation is a complicated book. There's no way I'm going to tell you, hey, guys, you gave your heart to the Lord. Start reading by the book of Revelation because you're going to go nuts. <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a study and the revelation that John is having is of the end of time, the end of the world. Which, by the way, I think is getting closer and closer by the day. Yesterday I went to Whole Foods and all of a sudden I'm there, I'm about to pay, you know, the, the, what I was going to eat. And I had a card in my hand and it says, you could pay with your palm. Like, you could what? You could pay with your palm? You know, I know about the touch ID on my phone and stuff like that. But paying with my palm, that's another thing. I was like, well, that's the mark of the beast right there. <laughs> you know, the Bible talks about that there's going to be a chip. You know, there's going to be a mark. They don't know if there's going to be a mark. You know, that you're not going to be able to buy. You're not going to be able to sell. You're not going to be able to live unless you have that mark. And I was like, man, did Whole Foods start this whole thing? You know, it's just... It's, just throwing that out there. It was bought by Amazon, just in case you didn't know. Okay, Whole Foods was bought by Amazon. Um, so John is having all these images of Jesus at the end of the times and how the world is going to come to an end and everything. And, ha- and he has this image of Jesus that I want you to leave this service today, getting ready for Good Friday with this image imprinted in your heart. And what's the image? Jesus as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, what an image John had of Jesus. It's found in Revelation 19, verse 11. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. He says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. This time, baby, it wasn't the donkey anymore. This time was the white horse. If you're here and you're a Shrek fan and you know the donkey, you're like, I know that donkey. No, this time it's not the donkey. It's the white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire. 
and on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, follow him on white horses. What an incredible scene here. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written. And that name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You see, there's a lot of imagery here. Okay, a sword coming out from his mouth, all that. That sword is really that he's speaking words. And through his words, he's putting things in place and chopping down and establishing what God wants to do. There's a lot of symbolism behind all this stuff. But there's one thing that is not a symbolism and is clear. That the rider of that white horse is the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. And why is that important for you and me to know today? Well, it's very important. Why? Because if we know that that King of kings and that Lord of lords is coming back. If every prophecy of the Bible has been fulfilled and the only ones that we're waiting to be fulfilled are the ones of the second return, well, I got some news for you, buddy. And what are the news? That these are going to be fulfilled as well. So you better be ready because the one that is coming back is not the humble king riding on the back of the donkey. The one that is coming back is the King of kings and the Lord of lords riding on a white horse. And what does that mean? That I better align my life. That means that I better recognize his lordship. That I better recognize that he is king and that there's no other. I better recognize that what he says is law over my life. And whatever is not aligned to what the Lord is saying, I say, Lord, this is the time to deal with all this stuff. Uh, once again, I said, none of us are perfect in this room. None of us, you know, have attained, you know, all this measure of maturity in Christ. We're all in the works. But if you're here today, and listen to what I'm going to say, you've been on the edge. What's on the edge? You know, being a youth pastor was fun for many years because I would have people saying, Pastor, how close can I get to sinning without really sinning? How close can I get to this edge without really falling? They wanted to know. I had a young person one day that told me, Pastor, I've grown up in church all my life. I'm leaving for a season. I'm like, where are you going? He goes, you have an amazing testimony. I want to have a testimony. So I'm going to go to the world to get a testimony to come back. Guess what? 30 years have passed. He never came back. He's still looking for a testimony. And while that's happening, he's lost a couple of marriages. Things have not gone the right way, but he's looking for a testimony. Because one day he goes, Pastor, how close can I be without falling over? Why am I telling you this today? Because Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. He's coming back. And you know what? We need to make sure that we're ready for when he comes back. He could come back any moment. That's a message that the church has lost. And that's a message that we need to pick up. The Lord is coming back. And I'm not going to live trembling and afraid. Oh, my God, he's coming back. He's coming back. No, but I want to make sure that when he comes back, oh, he finds me doing something that pleases his heart, that honors him. I have so many people sitting in front of me this morning. All you guys, different lives, different situations you're going through. But you know what? The Bible says that one day all the books will be opened in front of The book of your life, the book of my life will be open, laid bare in front of the Lord. And the Lord will say, okay, let's go to chapter 2 right here. Page 45. Let, let, let's see what happened here. Okay, let, let's go to chapter 6. Page 89. Let's see what happened here. And you know what I want to do? I want to make sure that my life is not perfect, but it's as pleasing as possible to my King and my Lord. You know why? Because we're going to celebrate this week everything that he did for you and he did for me. He sacrificed so much 
And the Bible says no one would die for a good person. You wouldn't send your son to die for a good person. Imagine for a bad person. And the father sent his son to die for you and to die for me. So we owe it to him that we live a life for him. I want you to close your eyes right there where you're at. Because he is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy of living a life that would honor him. And Jesus, you're in this room right now. You're in this room right now. And I know that you're speaking to the hearts of those that are here. You're speaking to those that are online. Continue, Lord. Do your work. You alone deserve Do your work, Lord. Just ask the Holy Spirit, what do you want to tell me through this message? now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone and all our praise. You're the name of You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name. Let me invite you to rise to your feet this morning and worship the Lord. Sing it to him this morning. He's in this room. Let's sing it to him. Just pour your heart as you sing to him today. Time, just tell them worthy is your name. Jesus, we thank you this morning for who you are, my God. We thank you for who you are. Thank you, Lord. For being that divine teacher, 
the bread of heaven, the light of the world. Thank you for being the King of kings and Lord of lords. And thank you, my God, for the work that you're doing in each and every one of us. And as we hear these different titles, and literally we could be preaching for months, Lord God, on these different images and titles, Lord God, that appear in Scripture about who you are. My desire is, Lord, that each of us in this room, we would have a clear image of who you are marked in our hearts and in our lives. And that we could align our lives, Lord, to that image of who you are. This morning, I thank you for the work that you're doing in each and every one of us. Pray, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would continue to perfect your work in each of us, Lord. Continue to perfect your work in each of us. Lord, that we would hear your words and we could be that, like that wise builder that puts them into practice. That we will not be like the foolish builder who hears the words and then he forgets about them and builds on the sand and then when the storm came, it just destroyed everything. Holy Spirit, help us to build correctly upon you, Jesus. You are the foundation. You are the foundation. And right there where you're at this morning, heads bowed, eyes closed, if you're in this room or through that camera and you've never surrendered your life to King Jesus, You've never surrendered your life to the Lord by recognizing him as your savior, by recognizing the sacrifice that he made for you on the cross, by inviting him into your life and saying, from this moment on, I'm, I'm not going to lead my own life. I'm going to give lordship. I'm going to surrender the direction of my life over to you. If you don't recall doing that consciously, today I want to give you the opportunity of coming to Christ. The Bible says that if you come to him, he will not cast you out. If you come and you recognize that you're a sinner and that by your sins, by your works, I'm sorry, you cannot be saved, but that you need his saving grace over your life. Today, right there where you're at, if you recognize these truths and you say, I need forgiveness, Jesus, forgive me. The Bible says that all your sins will be forgiven and you become a son or daughter of God. And the Holy Spirit will come and live in your life. And from this day on, let me tell you, the best part of your life will start. Now, if that's you, you're listening to me. And you say, Pastor, I've never made that decision. But I want to make it. I want to lead you in a prayer. This is called the sinner's prayer or the prayer of salvation. And there's power in words. And there's power in the words that will be coming out of your heart. But never, you've never prayed this before. So I want to lead you in this prayer. So there where you are, you're going to repeat with me and you're going to say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I recognize that I'm, a, that I'm a sinner and that by my works, I cannot be saved. Jesus, I recognize that you died on the cross to pay for my sins and that you resurrected on the third day to give me eternal life of which I take a hold of right now. Jesus, take me by the hand into the arms of my heavenly Father and fill me with the Holy Spirit and help me live the life that you have for me from this day forward. Thank you. Lord Jesus for coming to my life and in your name I pray and all God's people say amen and amen. Let's put our hands together and give him a big round of applause today. Okay, let's just take a seat for a moment guys. I want to address those that might be here or watching that made this prayer for the first time whether you're at home Okay, or you're here. If you made this prayer, the Bible says that your sins are forgiven. 
and that now Jesus Christ is living inside of you through his Holy Spirit. Okay, now we would like to know who you are. All right, and the way that you could do for that for us, the way that you could help me is that if you take the connect card that is in the seat pocket in front of you, if you're watching online, there's a link that you're going to see that is going to appear there on the screen. And you take that connect card, you fill it out, okay, you put your information, all right, don't worry, I'm not going to show up in your house on Monday in the evening, knock on the door, they remember me, I was preaching, I'm not going to do that, all right. But you are going to receive a little something from us in the mail, letting you know what are your following steps in this new faith in Christ, all right? So you take that Connect card and you fill it out and you put it in the mailboxes that we have in the back. Also, at the end of the service, my lovely wife and I will be in the Welcome Lounge, which will be through the glass doors to the left. If you are visiting or you made this prayer, okay, we would love to connect with you just for a moment, all right, so you could just go, whoever brought you today, whoever invited you could come as well, and we would love to spend those extra minutes with you this morning, okay, before we dismiss, I want to encourage you right now is our generosity moment where we give to our God, all right, what the Bible calls our tithes and our offerings is our giving that allows us to continue advancing the kingdom of heaven, continue preaching the word of God, continue enjoying this place where we're seated today. All right, so if you need an envelope, they're also found there in the seats that are with you. If you're going to give with your check card or cash, you're going to need one of those envelopes. If you're more digital and you want to give through text giving, the number's up there, 45777, or through Zale, 305-915-1606. All right, and those are the different platforms that we have in order for you to give this morning, all right? Uh, once we're done with that, you take those envelopes and you can also put them in the mailboxes that are in the back, all right? Good? All right, let's stand to our feet. I'm going to pray for you guys to be dismissed. If anybody needs prayer, we'll have some people here in the front to pray with you for whatever need you might be facing. Remember to take these flyers, take a few, take plenty. And pass them out, give them to people. They're in Spanish on one side and English on the other. So that's that. Father, thank you so much for this time that you allow us to be in your presence. Thank you for the work that you're doing in each of our lives. And thank you, Lord, that also today we have the privilege of giving and sowing into your kingdom. We understand that lives are changed and transformed, Lord God, through our generosity, Lord God. So bless those people that are giving today, Lord. And as we go this week, my God, be with us, that your mighty angels will be around us, Lord, and that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. And God's people say amen and amen. Guys, God bless you guys. Have an amazing rest of your Sunday.